Hey team, Mandy here, clinical nutritionist at The Body Reset. Hey, I want to take 10 minutes or maybe 15, we'll see how long this goes today, to talk about insulin resistance. We've been talking a lot about blood sugar control, living, and everything that goes into that a lot recently, but I want to give a little bit more of a cellular understanding of insulin resistance and just how important this is to us and what really insulin resistance actually is. So we're just going to spend a little bit of time on this today and talk about some things to do to improve it. So first, let's just explain what we're actually talking about here. Insulin resistance is a condition which results in the cells of our body becoming resistant to the effects of the hormone insulin. Now, insulin is the hormone, the way we want to describe this is insulin is the hormone that is essentially the key to our cells to allow us to get glucose into our cells. And as we know, we use glucose in our cells to produce energy and for various functions. So the way I like to kind of look at this to give a little bit of a visual understanding is think of you get home, you have to go to a cupboard perhaps that's locked put something away, you put the key in, you open the lock, you undo the door and you can put the stuff in. Insulin is that key to our cells. It allows us to unlock and allow us to get glucose into our cell. Now, insulin resistance is a situation where that key no longer works very well. Maybe it works some of the time, but not all of the time. It's just less efficient. It's a little bit more worn out. And what that means is, is it means that the glucose that we're getting from our food is spending more time in our bloodstream. So this results in elevated blood sugar levels, which has a flow on effect to elevating blood pressure, has a flow on effect from there to elevating blood glucose, has a flow on effect from there to elevated weight gain and or to weight gain, and then also to the development of fatty liver. So insulin resistance is really the beginning of just about every chronic disease that we have that kind of comes later on down the track and the thing with insulin resistance is it's very it's it's definitely underdiagnosed and that is because there is a lack of consensus around what the diagnostic criteria for insulin resistance actually is in the kind of medical and scientific community so what we know is there are a lot of people out there now and the numbers are increasing all the time that have this but we don't actually know exactly how many and it's probably way more than we think so uh, just a little bit of a statistic for you there last check or, or one of the recent checks was 2017 and it was sort of estimated with the measures that we had that more than one in three adults in the US has insulin resistant currently and just to hammer this kind of statistic home a little bit the chances of developing type 2 diabetes or those on flowing problems from insulin resistance is about 50 percent within five years so you know, of those one in three, more than one in three adults that have this in the United States now, you know, the, the, the outlook for them within five years is potentially quite a problem. So you can see there's quite an, quite an important topic for us to understand. But the cool thing with insulin resistance is that it develops as a result of, as a result of diet and lifestyle kind of factors, which means we can kind of mitigate those and move them back the other way. So I want to just, I want to just, head this up with a couple of thoughts. So one, there's a, um, a professor and a, and a scientist in this space, Dr. Ben Bickman, who he's probably one of the most researched people in this area of insulin resistance. And he literally says that insulin resistance is the mitigating factor for almost all chronic diseases. And it's the place we want to start. So when we look at insulin resistance, what precedes it? What leads the body to stop listening to that hormone insulin and stop uptaking that glucose well? Um, and there's three, th three key things here, and we're going to focus on one of them today, but I want to give you this kind of overview just to help you out. So the first one is inflammation. Now, inflammation sounds very, very vague. So when we're talking about inflammation, we're talking about elevated levels of pro-inflammatory molecules within the body. This can be from many different things, but one of the big things here is abdominal belly fat that fat that abdominal fat is particularly pro-inflammatory it releases a lot of inflammatory molecules into our body which can create a scenario where our cells become more resistant to insulin and this is partly why we really see 
um, insulin resistance and weight gain going hand in hand. In fact, it was once thought that insulin resistance was a result of obesity. Um, we now know that's not the case, but they very often play together, unfortunately. So inflammation is a key driver of insulin resistance. And so this really is relevant for a lot of people because you know, um, there's many ways that we can be having a, an elevated inflammatory response in our body. The next one is stress. And when I say stress, again, it sounds very, very vague because how do we kind of measure and categorize stress? But what we're talking about here is elevated levels of two key stress hormones, which is cortisol and epinephrine. So when these are elevated, they cause our cells to become more insulin resistant. So we're, if we're living in this place of chronic stress all the time from all of the different possible reasons and sources, then we're going to be at greater risk of developing insulin resistance um, throughout our body. And the third one, and the one we're going to focus on here, because it's the one we maybe have the most control of, and that is insulin itself. Insulin itself actually causes insulin resistance. Now, what's going on here is our body is, is designed to, when it gets a stimulus that is beyond what it can kind of cope with, it down-regulates the cell's receptors for that stimulus. So this is kind of like a mum who's got a kid yelling in her ear all the time and you start to not listen quite so much. Hey, you kind of tune it out a little bit. The trouble is just like um, a little kid who's asking for a snack and they're just going to yell louder and louder until you answer them, um, insulin does the same thing. So our cells down regulate the receptors for it when insulin is constantly high, but as a result, insulin just goes higher. So it's trying to you know, our body's trying to be like, oh, there's too much, I can't deal with all this. And so insulin's just upregulated higher and higher. So insulin becomes its own problem in that it snowballs things out of control. So this was the one we're going to focus on because this is the one we can actually have a very real impact on when it comes to our movement and nutrition choices. So when we're looking at insulin resistance and wanting to improve this over time, what we need to be looking at is two key areas. We want to be thinking about exposure and we want to be thinking about our ability to regulate. So exposure is looking at how often is our insulin rising, how high is it rising, and how long is it staying risen. And then regulation is our ability to bring that back down in a healthy way. Now, when we're taught when the the way the reason I'm so kind of passionate about this and and excited for this is our body reset program is taking all of these concepts into account. And we've really built out the meal structure and the movement patterns and all that to optimize for better insulin control overall. So um, a lot of these things are things that our clients will see coming through and just the way we structure our meals and whatnot. So let's talk first about exposure because when we're talking about exposure, we're thinking about meal timing. We're thinking about meal composition. Um, yeah, meal timing and composition, two key things. So when it comes to timing, we're looking at how often are you eating? Because if you're snacking all the time, every time you're snacking, you're elevating your insulin up. So even though you might not necessarily be snacking on, say, half a block of chocolate all the time, which would obviously send your insulin really high, you may just be having this kind of constant spike of insulin, which means your insulin is constantly high throughout the whole day. And again, it's that level of exposure that the body turns down the receptors to it because the noise is too great. So what we want to do with meal timing is we want to look at having a really well-balanced meal and then a gap. So getting away from snacking, getting towards whole foods and whole meals and then having a break. Not only is this great for our digestive system, but it's really, really important for our insulin sensitivity and insulin control as well. So meal timing is looking at, you know, three to four really good meals throughout the day and cut out the snacks because one, you don't need them. Two, they're doing nothing for your insulin um, control. So meal timing and then meal composition. So if you have a meal that's, say, rice bubbles, for example, there's very little protein in there. There's very little fat. There's just a whole lot of carbohydrates. You're going to get this really big high elevated insulin response which is probably going to come crashing down really quickly and that's a separate issue but that's a problem so we really want to minimize the actual level that we're jumping to and we do that with prioritizing fats and proteins because fats and proteins don't stimulate that insulin rise to quite the same degree as the carbohydrates we're also looking at the quality of carbohydrates and we've talked about this before 
um, looking at um, the, where the carbs are coming from. Are they coming from a refined source, in which case it's quick energy into the body, quick sugar spike, quick insulin spike, or we're getting them from things like kuma and potato, brown rice, et cetera, where the body has to work a bit harder to get that energy out and we don't spike quite so high. So we're looking at food sources that minimize that spike overall um, and then timing our meals carefully so that we're not constantly just sitting in the space of elevated insulin response. So that's the exposure piece. And then if we move on from there and we look at the regulation piece, this is about our body's ability to actually get our insulin back down again. And the, the really cool thing here is this is about movement. So, but it's not movement in the sense of just moving more in, in a chunk. It's about how we split that across the day. And it's about our muscle. So our muscle is really, really important when it comes to insulin sensitivity because our muscle cells are incredibly insulin sensitive, but they also become insulin resistant really, really quickly when they're not used. And the more muscle we have, the more we are able to get our glucose down, which can reduce the need for insulin to go so high. So it can help reduce that insulin overall. And um, like statistically, about 80% of our glucose post a meal is picked up by a muscle. So the more muscle you have, you know, I always say this, you don't have to be a bodybuilder. It's simply about having and stimulating active muscle on your frame to actually balance your energy systems out. So muscle is really important. So when we're looking at movement and we're looking at regulation of insulin, we're looking at two key things. We're looking at, are you exercising in a way that is stimulating your muscles that is allowing you to be as insulin sensitive as possible and use your glucose as efficiently as possible post meal? So this is where we're really looking at resistance and strength training over just a whole lot of running on a treadmill or, you know, just a, a really long mountain bike ride on the weekend or something and very little movement throughout the week. We're looking at actually maintaining the muscle we have on our body. And for most people, it's actually going to be building a little bit of muscle because if we haven't focused on building muscle to this point, you're, th um, you're 35, 40, 45, 50, et cetera, then we need to probably be building a little bit of muscle, especially if you have some weight to lose as well. So there's strength training in there. And then the other piece of the regulation is movement throughout the day. We Our blood sugar control is vastly improved by getting up and moving around so that our body can actually get that glucose into our muscles and not just have it sitting there. So a 10-minute walk after a meal, it significantly brings that glucose down, brings that insulin back down. So we're not sitting at that constantly elevated level. And this is where... You know, there's a lot of nuance to this, but this is where the things like having that um, sugary snack after dinner while you're sitting and watching some TV and then you're going off to bed, it seems like a little harmless habit. But the impact that that might be having on your insulin levels might be the thing that is really sidetracking results for you because it's just particularly at that time of night because our insulin production and all that is already not optimized because we're supposed to be sleeping, not eating but also we're just going to then go and sleep on that energy and not actually actively burn it. So, you know, timing of these things, dose and exposure is all really, really important to understand when it comes to insulin resistance. And, and you know, the tricky thing with insulin resistance is, is that it goes on below the surface and people don't know that it's happening. So, um, you know, things like I put in my post earlier today about um, weight, potentially weight gain, high cholesterol, fatty liver markers, high blood pressure, particularly that belly fat, et cetera. But things as well that are a little bit more subtle, feeling tired after a meal that's got a bit more carbohydrates in or um, mid-afternoon energy slumps or those sorts of things. Actually, even things um, as subtle as wounds that just don't really heal very well can all be connected back to insulin uptake and glucose control. So really, really important for us to take this into account and make sure that when we're looking at structuring our meals and our movement and all that, that we're optimizing for the best insulin control that we can have um, and not kind of exacerbating a problem that might be simmering away below the surface already. Cool. So that's what I've got for you today, team. Hopefully helpful, giving you a little bit of context on what this thing called insulin resistance actually is and how we can improve it with some very simple diet and lifestyle habits, I guess. Um, if this was useful for you, if this has sparked something for you and you want to know a little bit more, just comment 
sugar control below and we can give you our give out our guide for sugar controlled living which kind of goes into a little bit more detail on this topic and explains it a little bit more because it, it's so so relevant i mean those statistics are pretty scary to be fair um it's relevant for all of us to understand and know and take action on so enjoy the rest of your day team i will see you next time bye